Good evening and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home Resilience presented by TD Bank Group. I'm Jennifer Hollett and I am the Executive Director of the Walrus and we are thrilled to be joining you this evening live across the country and beyond in conversation. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on. I'm in downtown Toronto right now, to Toronto. I come to you from the traditional ter territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We're honored to carry on a long tradition of storytelling. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on and its history, wherever you're joining us from tonight. A bit more about the walrus. The Walrus started 18 years ago, really as an optimistic project to tell the stories of Canada and to foster conversation. And we do this in a variety of ways, from our journalism in the print edition, but also online daily at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, to our public event series, The Walrus Talks, which is now The Walrus Talks at Home, My Home, and Your Home. And this work is made possible by our donors, our supporters and our partners. So we're really excited to be doing this event tonight with TD Bank Group. So thank you to TD for making this possible. To kick things off, I'm excited to welcome Naki Asute, Associate Vice President, Social Impact Canada, TD Bank Group. Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, Jen. And good evening, everyone. I'm just thrilled to be here tonight on behalf of TD at the Walrus Talks at Home tonight's event on resilience. Through our corporate citizenship platform, the TD Ready Commitment, we've been supporting the Walrus Talk since 2018 to provoke new thinking and spark conversation on matters that are vital to Canadians. So it's wonderful that the Walrus has continued these important conversations virtually so that we can keep building a more informed and inclusive society together. Like the Walrus, TD is committed to fostering inclusive and accessible communities. And that's why we're proud to partner with the Walrus on events like these. Over the past year, we faced challenges we never thought possible. The pandemic has touched us all. But we also know that the adverse effects of the pandemic have not been distributed evenly across society. Low income, racialized communities, and people with disabilities have seen the greatest of that adversity. But what is true is that any of us can become resilient. It's a muscle that we can build and strengthen as we overcome challenges. But I would argue what's even more important is addressing the conditions that create the need for people to be resilient in the first place. We can help create a more resilient society by helping enable learning, fostering a sense of belonging for all, and ensuring equitable access to opportunities for all diverse communities. Another way TD is committed to this is through its support of the TD Fellowship on Disability and Inclusion. The Walrus announced last week the appointment of Jason Herderick as a 2021 TD Fellow on Disability and Inclusion. Congratulations, Jason. We're so proud to support this fellowship, which helps content creators with disabilities build their careers while contributing to the learning journeys of institutions like the Walrus and TD. In working together, we can help create the conditions for more emerging creative talent of all abilities to succeed in an ever-changing world. And so now it's time to listen to the experts that the Walrus has invited tonight. I'm excited to learn about how to cultivate resilience in the face of adversity from our four experts. Thank you all for joining us. And back to you, Jen. Thank you, Naki, for sharing that announcement as well as your reflections. I am excited to get into this one because the word resilience has come up a lot after the last year that Naki just described. This conversation is an important one because the pandemic has really highlighted that our society's fault lines are more and more evident and stress is at an all time high. Here's how it works. Each speaker has five minutes. And then once your head is full of new ideas, we're going to open it up and have a moderated Q&A with our speakers and you, our audience at home. Tonight, we will be hearing from live. Vinita Srivastava, host and producer of the Don't Call Me Resilient podcast from The Conversation. 
Justin Medifingers, who is a performing artist, writer, director, and producer. Philomena Okeke Herjurka, aka Dr. Phil, who is a professor of women's and gender studies and the director of the Pan-African Collaboration for Excellence at the University of Alberta, as well as Jeff Adams, Paralympic gold medalist. What a stellar lineup. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And we're gonna kick things off with Benita. So I'm gonna send it over to you. Hi everyone. I'm Vinita Srivastava. I'm an editor at The Conversation and the host and producer of Don't Call Me Resilient, an anti-racist podcast. So uh, this week, my family attended both a wedding and a funeral. The funeral was from my uncle and the wedding was from my brother. His fiance, whose family is in India, recently lost her father to COVID. Although the events are in different countries far away, from far away from each other, the fact that these events can happen on the same day is a marker of the pandemic. These are the times we are living in, which demand that we both celebrate and mourn on the same day. It demands a certain kind of resilience of us. And I want to honor and celebrate that resilience. Yet there's been a kind, a rise of a kind of another oppressive call for grit along with that celebration of resilience. The assumption is that we just need to lean in as Sheryl Sandberg so famously put it. It was around the time of lean in that I started hearing the word resilient attached to whole communities as well as to cities. This was a shift in language. A few years earlier, when I was a grad student in international affairs, the language used was more goal oriented and included things like ending poverty and ending food insecurity, goals I actually believed achievable when I was a grad student. This distinct policy shift from development goals to creating resilient cities struck me. Celebrating resilience and demanding it are two different things. For example, Toronto was going to be one of 100 resilient cities and the Rockefeller Foundation was going to help whole communities learn to be resilient. So it seemed that instead of working on fixing issues like inequality in healthcare and um, inequality in healthcare and poverty, we should now be focused on celebrating those that survive despite these problems. In other words, we may not be willing to truly challenge our belief systems to help change things, or we may not have the resolve to stop it, but we can celebrate the resilience of communities that survive despite the denial of some basic human rights. When I moved back to Toronto after a decade in New York, one of the first things I did was start an organization called Verse City. The organization was for marginalized youth and I got a grant for from the United Way and I partnered with the CBC and I designed a program to teach young people how to tell stories about their lives. I ran the program based on the idea that empowering marginalized youth to tell their own stories would help them become more active in society. Later, when I traveled to India and I traveled to Rwanda and I connected young people to the project, my youth worker counterparts, especially in India, really challenged me. To me, when I used the word empowered, I meant things like becoming stronger and more confident. But as I grew to understand from my peers in India, the concept of individual empowerment ignores structural obstacles. This is similar to the issues surrounding the word resilient. While resilient might be a worthwhile tool for some and a beautiful thing to behold and celebrate, it is not a useful tool as a policy or as an organizing principle. Celebrating Toronto as a resilient space, celebrating Toronto as a resilient city, especially during COVID, may be great for civic pride, but what does it do to address systemic issues like housing and homelessness, land theft, police violence? You probably know by now that Sandberg's corporate feminism has been deeply challenged since her lean in days, especially by working moms of color the most famous one being Michelle Obama, who told a Brooklyn crowd, it's not always enough to lean in because that shit doesn't work all the time. Another word that pops up to resilience is grit. In a TED Talks, US psychologist Andrea Duckworth said she could determine if a child was going to be successful by how much grit they showed in school. But research has shown that black children in North American schools are more resilient than their white counterparts. Why is this? because they have to be. 
because black students, but also indigenous and also some racialized students have to find ways to cope with the ongoing psychological and emotional stress of daily racism. These students learn to deal from a young age. Education professor Carl James says kids can get trapped by this idea of their resilience because they keep bouncing back no matter what we do. The structural racism combined with Canada's alarming pattern of income inequality for children of color means that our children, our future population is greatly impacted by inequalities like a lack of tech resources, green playgrounds, and for some indigenous children, safe drinking water. In these many cases, is it fair to say grit and resilience will get you through? So yes, being resilient should be a celebration. We need resilience to survive. But in the context of development or urban policies, this language also covers up brutal structural realities. And instead, it leans into a kind of celebration of suffering. Well, maybe the grit that we need right now is the courage to withdraw from systems that no longer serve us. And maybe we should call on our leaders to have the resilience and the fortitude to work with and listen to communities who can lead the way for massive structural changes. Thank you for listening. Hello, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so many uh, important things that you that you hit there. Um, my name is Justin Many Fingers, and uh, I am a uh, uh, live in many facets of the artistic uh, community and industry. Um, I am a Blackfoot uh, Native to be Indigenous person from the uh, Kainai Reserve in southern Alberta, and um, pre pandemic. Uh, I was basically trying to survive in, in, in many things and uh, uh, really focused on writing and producing and uh, creating and, uh, you know, still doing the auditions and, and all of that. And uh, I had a very uh, um, overwhelming and in, in, in the bestest of, of ways um, of being the artistic director, former artistic director of the Making Treaty 7 Culture Society. And, uh, you know, coming from that organization when it was first created uh, in Calgary and Southern Alberta and Blackfoot Territory, um, I was, you know, I was the youngster, I was like 21 when it, when it first started and that kind of really gave me my uh, roots within uh, indigenous art, explorations and creations and um, having this opportunity to create uh, within the indigenous culture. And, uh, you know, fast forward to uh, about a year ago, uh, to actually um, being the focus eye of what does it, what is indigenous arts in Alberta and Southern Alberta and specifically in Calgary and uh, the many nations that's uh, a part of uh, the, the Treaty 7. Um, and I've been very fortunate as well uh, to have this year, just over a year of actually doing nothing. This is the most nothing I've never done in my entire life. And uh, it was extremely hard uh, not having, you know, that nine to five. Well, in the arts, it's more like, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But, um, you know, just to really kind of sit and really have to self-reflect the last almost 14 years from training to professional uh, career. Um, and uh, I moved back uh, down south uh, to my parents' place. And um, that was very interesting because I haven't lived here in about... Uh, seven years. Um, but one of the things that really stood out is just kind of living again on the land. You know, I had a really great apartment downtown Calgary and, you know, being in the arts 24 seven and, you know, just having all of that and coming back here uh, to my roots, um, you know, where we don't have drinking water at uh, my parents' place. Um, we have to, you know, load a, uh, 
a big water tank uh, in my dad's farm truck and drive about uh, 15 minutes down the road and pour water in it, get to the house, pour it into uh, the water system here to have functioning water. Uh, we don't drink that water just because we don't know what can get into get into the system and um, like even brushing our teeth, drinking it, cook it. We don't use that. We use uh, bottled water. And, uh, you know, the wasteful resourceness of um, even water in general is, uh, was quite almost disturbing of how much bottled water we have to go through just to survive. And, uh, you know, again, going back to, to the planet and everything that we have, um, it's, we, we just need to survive. And um, that was one simple facet of, you know, the many things that uh, really has brought me back to my roots and uh, actually getting my hands dirty, planting stuff, building stuff, using power tools. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of that stuff and now the weather's getting nice and, and just being in the openness, you know, the closest neighbor is about 10 minutes away to go get groceries. You have to drive uh, at least an hour anywhere to get affordable groceries or anything of that. Uh, nearest gas station is like uh, 20 minutes away. So I'm very secluded uh, in this area, but you know, this is where I was born and raised. This is where my parents, um, you know, started their family. Um, and this is where they come from. And this is where I do come from. In my years of uh, Indigenous creation and performance is, you know, that translation into the uh, Indigenous language or this, uh, for me specifically, was the Blackfoot language. And one of the things, you know, when I am a part of these is, you know, talking about art, but, you know, it was hard to find the Blackfoot word. And in many of these uh, instances, when talking to elders and, and knowledge keepers, there isn't a word for art in the Blackfoot language and culture because the language and culture is artistic in, in, in every facet of survival. And being an artist, you know, we're always, you know, trying to survive uh, within that. Um, you know, the stories are so important. If you get the wrong story, tell the wrong story. Someone, you know, could starve to death, basically, or not know how to uh, identify uh, bloodlines through paintings and pictographs. And, you know, so all this artistic, um, you know, the songs that have, you know, there's, they're timeless. They're, they don't know when they were created, a lot of these uh, ceremonial songs that only specific people can create. Um, but yeah, so that kind of led me, you know, looking at my life again and looking at the uh, artistic aspect of what I do for a living and and reconnecting to the culture again and and that big disconnect uh, within that um, has always kind of fascinated me uh, sorry I'm uh, a minute and 38 seconds over my five minutes uh, so I will stop it there um, but again thank you to the walrus for this and uh, everyone's continuous efforts of moving this forward and uh, for our participants that uh, are here viewing thank you so much for being a part of this thank you everyone and uh, okay and also thanks to the last two speakers for your words of wisdom my name is uh, Philo Keki Hejirika. I am a professor of women and gender studies at the University of Alberta here in Edmonton. I also head the Pan-African Collaboration for Excellence, uh, which seeks to improve the lives of people of African descent locally and globally. Just wanna share a few thoughts about this concept called resilience. I grew up as a child of war in Southeastern Nigeria. Amidst the ruins of a civil war, I rummaged the landfill of the military base in my village for something to eat, bread, margarine, cake, discarded by the conquering soldiers that might still be edible. I started kindergarten under a tree in 1970, and by 2008, became a full professor in one of Canada's finest universities. Most people would say that I am highly resilient, but the truth is that my experience is not uncommon among indigenous peoples, blacks, immigrants, etc. My achievements are more due to the kindness of strangers than to resilience. 
I'm aware of the millions of far more resilient people I left behind on my way up. The kindness of strangers may reward the resilience of a few, but it doesn't confront the systemic barriers faced by the majority. What's my point? Resilience simply defined as the capacity to survive adversity is a gospel that marginalized Canadians should be preaching to the mainstream, not the other way around. We are already over resilient. We are already survivors. Well, I don't totally discount the gospel of resilience. I agree with this strength-based approach, which seeks, at least affirms that I'm of value to and not a burden to Canada. But I wrestle with the concept that is uniformly applied to all cultures and contexts, despite its inherently Eurocentric, neoliberal, and individualistic foundations. Come to think of it, there is no word for resilience in African epistemology. What comes close is the maxim of Ubuntu, literally translated as I am because we are. Ubuntu upholds the inherent dignity and goodness of all humanity, prioritizing family and community over the individual. Individuals operate within a web of moral commitments and duties to the broader society. As such, self-actualization for people like me goes beyond personal desires and achievements. Rather, success interweaves both personal and collective goals. I'm also suspicious of the connection between resilience and mental health as extended to newcomer populations, people like me. The immigrant paradox syndrome we all have heard about is a proven long-standing pattern which shows that, I quote, recent immigrants often outperform more established immigrants and non-immigrants on a number of health, education, and conduct or crime-related outcomes despite the numerous barriers they face to successful social integration. My point, we appreciate the benefits of mental well-being, but as they would say in my village, we didn't cross, we didn't climb seven mountains and swim across seven seas to get to Canada, simply to improve our mental health. What exactly am I getting at? We need to re-envision the concept of resilience. Marginalized Canadians do not want to merely survive. They want to thrive, to contribute to Canada's economic prosperity and multicultural heritage. So we need to be given a chance. We need to be equipped. As one of my research participants aptly stated, I do not ex expect Canada to put me on a pedestal. All I ask for is a bridge. My final thoughts on beginning points to re-envisioning resilience. I think we need a shift from the current paternalistic savior's approach, which infantilize and pathologize our ways of knowing and being. Because the bodies of lead of knowledge, which inform current services and programs, they do not reflect our realities. Systemic barriers like anti-Black racism are destroying our families and communities. As a stakeholder in my research program uttered in astonishment, how can we serve them well if we know so little about them? I want to conclude my talk with a comment from University of Alberta's uh, Associate Vice President, Dr. Laura Beard. She says that if we consider Ubuntu a more dynamic conception of resilience, then we must begin our quest to transform society by understanding not only the mainstream, but also those who live in the margins we need to understand all of the eyes that make up the we in this country. We must begin by asking, who are the we as we? And who are the eyes that make up that we, which constitutes Canada? I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Adams, and I'm on my third career. Uh, I started as an athlete competing at the Paralympics, and when I retired, I started two medical device engineering companies, uh, which I sold a number of years ago. I went back to school, and I'm now working as a lawyer in the area of labor employment and human rights. You know, as an athlete, I get to travel the world and, and hear the, the sound of celebration. That sound always 
reminded me that I was part of a celebration and surrounded by excellence. And I've come to realize that we are always surrounded by excellence. Some days are easier than others. Um, and on the tough days for me, I always try to remind myself about being surrounded by excellence. But we have to choose to make an effort to understand it and to be a part of it. Um, the year after the Paralympics in Sydney, Edmonton was hosting the World Championships and the 1500 meter uh, wheelchair event was on the schedule. And three weeks before the event, in my last very difficult training session, I fractured a small bone in my wrist. I tried to keep training, but I, I just couldn't train at the level that I needed to. And word had gotten out that I was injured. Uh, everyone in the race knew that by going fast, it would make it the most difficult race for me. Uh, and with 200 meters to go, I was in every shade of pain you can imagine. Uh, as ashamed as I am to admit it to this day, uh, I had given up. Um, and I told you about traveling the world and the sound, the, you know, the sound of celebration in the stadiums, the sound of celebration that reminded me about being surrounded by excellence. But, but that day in Edmonton, the sound took on a new dimension because right at the top of the turn, right when I'd given up, I heard someone cheering my name. And it did something unexpected because it went from being the sound of celebration to the sound of support. And it reminded me of all the people who had helped get me to that point. It didn't make me fitter, faster, stronger. It didn't push me to the finish line, but it did something better because it gave me the courage to dig a little bit deeper and try to look harder on a day when I didn't believe I had the energy to do that. And that's what resilience is often about. It's finding the courage to face your barriers. It's not always about overcoming them, but having the courage to try is always the first step. And, and I tried that day, I tried as hard as I could, um, but I still came up a little bit short. I finished in second place. I don't normally like silver medals, but um, it's the best medal I ever won because every time I look at it, every time I think about that race, uh, it reminds me that none of us get to our finish lines alone. The people who surround us with excellence will make that sound of support for us on the days when we need to hear it. And, and we all have people in our lives who will make that sound for us. Please listen for that sound. On the days when you need to find the courage to face up to the barriers in your lives. But most importantly, please make that sound for the people in, the li in your lives that you care about. Help them find courage on days when they may need it. You know, that same summer, I had an opportunity to go to a training camp. Uh, one of the kids attending the camp was using a wheelchair and wasn't fitting in very well. And I brought my racing chair uh, to let him try to. Now, you have to imagine my chair was significantly better technology than this kid had access to. He took, he took one push and he made a sound. It was the sound of a kid having fun. But it was also the sound that people make when they get access to something that could change their lives. And I'll never forget that sound. And if I had to choose between hearing either of those two sounds ever again, the sound of the crowd or the sound that kid made when he got access to something that could change his life, it wouldn't take me a heartbeat to decide which one. And that's the biggest lesson that sport teaches. It teaches us to always strive for the biggest celebration possible. But it's the small celebrations along the way that, that define us, that, that make us into the people that we want to be, that let us practice resilience. And we do that by keeping our messages as strong, as clear, and as consistent as we can, by making the sound of support to the people in our lives that we care about, and by remembering that none of us get to our finish lines alone. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I have to say my individual sound is yes. And it's a larger <sighs> that you describe. Thank you so much to Jeff, Philomena, Justin, and Vinita. We are excited to be able to open up this conversation. Resilience, what it is, what it isn't, and what it could be. Now, I want to give a shout out to all of our audience members. We have people registered from all over from Vancouver to Canada, Exeter to Ancaster, San Francisco to Buenos Aires, and uh, Bogota to Lima. 
We encourage all of you joining us from home to share this conversation on social media. We love seeing how you're watching us, so feel free to take a picture uh, or capture your favorite moments from the talks and conversation. Use our hashtag, hashtag Walrus Talks, and we're at the Walrus on the different platforms. Our moderator this evening is a writer and a producer and a former Walrus TD Fellow on Disability and Inclusion. You're in for a treat. I'm excited to welcome back Amy Lowe. Amy, great to see you. Thanks, Jen. Well, the treat is truly all mine. What a spectacular uh, gathering of stories and perspectives tonight. I'm so grateful to the Walrus for the opportunity to moderate today. It's awesome to be back. And I wanna thank uh, Vinita, Jeff, Philomena and Justin for your thoughtful and engaging talks tonight. I've got a lot of questions and I'm sure the audience has too. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna invite the speakers back now. So come on down, Vinita, Jeff, Philomena and Justin. We're gonna start the Q&A and just to uh, let the folks out there watching know, submit us a question in the Zoom chat box, please. We really wanna hear your thoughts and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, maybe we will, but if we don't, we see them, we love them. So please keep sending them in. Um, so my first question is for you, Vinita, and I really appreciated your point uh, that focusing on resilience can remove focus from social or structural barriers. And I wanted to ask you to go a little bit further in what the relationship between resilience and fairness is for you in, in your point of view. What do you mean by fairness? Are you talking about equity or what kind of fairness? I don't know. I throw <laughs> the word out to you because you used the word in your talk and it kind of perked my interest. So Take it in any direction that you that you'd like. Well, you know, uh, the 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 idea of resilience being something that we can celebrate is yeah. Do you mean sorry? Do you I do mean justice? I guess that was the question when you say fairness. Are you talking about um, resilience and justice? That that idea of resilience. Um, I guess my main critique of resilience is, is really as the idea that we can ask whole communities to continue to be resilient, even though we have these massive structural inequalities within our own land, within our own country, we have massive inequalities. And so when we ask, when we, when we, when we talk about celebrating communities as, you know, celebrating children or celebrating communities as being resilient, isn't that child amazing that, they go to school and there's no, they can't use the drinking fountain in their school or they go to school and there's police presence in their school, but, but they get through it, they're resilient. Um, and that's the critique that, that I'm trying to make that um, there, there is a, a lack of equity. There's a lack of, uh, you know, there's a lack of equity across the board when it comes to how different children, um, what kind of access different children have to different services. And so that's, what, that's the critique of resilience. That's the idea of, fairness, I guess you're talking about. This is the, the idea of equality. Thanks. I, uh, I noticed some similarities between your point and Philomena's idea of the gospel of resilience. So Philomena, do you want to just jump in and, and, and tell us a little bit more about what you mean by the gospel of resilience? No, I, I, resilience is considered um, at least one of the so-called strength-based approaches. Uh, I think it became popular because it moved away from considering people's deficits to focusing on their strengths. Uh, that's a good thing. The concern I have is uh, res resilience is a neoliberal, for the most part, Eurocentric uh, word in the sense that it, for, one, for one thing, it focuses on the individual, but we are talking about a lot of populations that are, we call them collectivist cultures. They are communal, which means that they may not, you know, these cultures may not want what we want or everything that we want. Uh, their successes and whatever is driving them may not be the same. But also I end my speech with talking about the fact that 
we don't really know these people well because much of what exists in current knowledge is from the mainstream. So when we talk about, we know they need support. We know you cannot make someone resilient without adding support system. But even developing that support system is a problem because they, are, they remain highly under-researched. We know very little about their ways of knowing and being. So that's what concerns me about when I call it the gospel of resilience. That is a conversation of the mainstream hoisted on us. Mm -hmm. And the mainstream, you mean what you what you mentioned as Eurocentric kind of yeah. what people might consider Western kind of ideas. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I love um, that too, the gospel of resilience. That was beautiful. <laughs> it's so catchy too, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it kind of brings in a question that I have for you, Justin, which is, you mentioned survival, you, you know, you use the word survival in so many different instances in your talk, you know, the arts industry before the pandemic, 12 hour days, um, the need to tell the right story in order to survive and even, you know, water and access to water. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the relationship that you envision for between survival and resilience. Um, growing up and raised in this by world of Western ideologies and structures and uh, a lot of what remains of the culture and not really fit, kind of being like a third world within these two different worlds that we kind of live in. Um, both my parents went to residential school. Um, I'm very fortunate, I uh, just turned 34 uh, in March, but uh, I'm kind of a part of that first generation who hasn't gone to residential school. But I always talk about um, uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that I've been through as an individual, and you compare that to someone who's gone to residential school, you wouldn't be able to really tell the difference of who went and who didn't, you know, how much the effects um, were still very present. So, you know, my parents, you know, being scared by the church to even speak the language uh, kind of, um, put that fear of the devil uh, to a culture that they are and they're a part of um, and not growing up so much with that cultural ideologies and and the structure of that and you know this western world you know going to school on the reserve learning about the outside world um, and not feeling a part of it um, where i come from i feel that uh, i'm one of the very few who has gotten out who has survived um, and I feel a lot of privilege within that even within my community um, you know I moved back here by choice uh, which is almost a privilege where a lot of families still have to access drinking water you know Lethbridge is an hour drive Calgary is like a two-hour drive you know we're still within means but if you don't have a vehicle you're you're kind of screwed in the middle of nowhere right so this idea of survival and resilience um, doesn't make sense for me it's a very western um, ideology of survival and res you know survival is a western ideology uh, of of resilience. Um, so identifying with those or feeling that I'm a part of any of those, it's just the way of life uh, that is currently still present in this world. Um, education, clean water, um, language, culture. Uh, you know, a lot of the people who've grown up on the reserve, you know, I, I'm very fortunate that, you know, through my artistic uh, career and uh, interest into the culture that's how I was able to kind of reimmerse myself into uh back into the culture but uh, a lot of people have lived here don't know nothing about the culture don't know that there's not a word for art uh you know and so you know a lot of people don't speak the language um, but then there are some who are my age who know so much more than me and you know are raised by the old people and uh, know so much more, but uh, yeah. So this idea of uh, survival and resilience. Um, I like how you said survival is art. Art, art is survival. Like that was really beautiful. 
Yeah, how you, thank you. Yeah, it's just love. It's just amazing to me. It was very, it really struck. It really struck a, really struck something for me, that that you're saying in in um, um, in Blackfoot. There's no word for art, because everything is art. Yeah, you have to survive on art, or else you know you don't know which direction is where. You know these songs, you know of of survival and how you do certain ceremonies of survival and when you hunt. You know we only had two seasons really. We only had the first snowfall and the first thunderstorm that determined what was coming next. But all of these uh, uh, ceremonial practices were in essence of when the berries grow, when you harvest, what was coming next. You know everything has a chain reaction. And without these ceremonies and without these paintings or these uh, pictographs or, or songs, you would, you, would, you would starve to death. So a culture that you know, has survived here, you know, dating back a minimum 14,000 years, you know, every aspect and every facet uh, with, within this, you know, and I, I identify as a, as a, a dis disabled uh, artist which is very new to me because again, it was survival and resilience. So it's hard for me to determine what that is when you're living it every day. And the uh, mad, deaf, disabled uh, art, arts community has taken me in and kind of helped identify that for me when I never did that most of my life, right? So it's in the culture, we, we, we do have Blackfoot sign language it was always a part of it. So it wasn't used if it was a disability, it was constantly built into the culture so that no one was ever discluded uh, from anything. Uh, we look at mental health, you know, people who can see things that we can't see were the ones who can see onto the other side. It's considered schizophrenia and it's, you know, you're given a bunch of medication or it's treated something different that actually aggravates uh, a part of those. Um, when it was accepted in the culture for the ones who can see the ones that we can't see and can communicate to the other side. So again, those those two worlds of this Western world and this indigenous world and how Thanks, it has Justin. evolved here. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry, yes. No, no, it's <laughs> I go, it keep really, going, going. No, it's, My bad. it's sorry amazing for to hear space. your thoughts. And <laughs> honestly, it kind of leads into something that I wanted to touch on with Jeff, which was, um, I love the way that you kind of use sound to tell your story, Jeff. And and you mentioned the sound that that child made when they tried out your chair for the first time. And I, you know, in all aspects of your talks tonight, you talked about access in different ways. And and like you you mentioned, we need to equity in different ways. And so I I wanted to ask you, Jeff, what did hearing that sound of that child at the summer camp? Um, tell you or evoke in you about access to tech or wheelchairs, uh, specifically for, for young kids with disabilities? Yeah, I mean, I guess that moment really crystallized things in many ways for me, because as, as an athlete, you know, you're given things, you're given technology and clothes and sunglasses and <clears throat> opportunities to participate in programs and training and coaching and support that is not available to everyone and 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 this kid by providing him with something that he didn't have access to um, gave him an opportunity that he wouldn't have had and that's what accessibility is about it's about opening doors and and, and letting people get into venues and uh, programs and opportunities but it's important to give people the things that they need access to the things that they need and so the technology that helped me as a racer um, and, and possibly helped this kid with a mobility disability wouldn't be the correct thing to provide the, the right sound to support to give to someone who had something else that they needed, some other um, um, aspect, of some door that they needed to be opened. And I think everyone, all of the speakers have touched on that where we have to understand the world that we're part of, participate in it, and 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 get the most out of it by, in, you know, including the most people that we can 
by opening the doors as wide as we can. And then, and that's what I mean when I talk about making the sound of support, it comes in many different shapes and, and configurations. And it's of course, you know, an, an analogy and, and sounds can be actions or um, behaviors or changes to systems. Um, but we have to make those changes and we have to make the, the, not just the sound of support, but the correct sound for the people um, that we're surrounded by, for the excellence uh, that we're surrounded by to make the most of both the people and the excellence. Thanks, Jeff. And I have a question that may sort of lead from that from uh, a Kate, who's an audience member. And Kate asks, and I'll, I'll just throw this out to, to all of you. Um, so please do jump in. Kate asks, has the term resilience been weaponized to diminish legitimate complaints and the call for meaningful action? I think, I think in some ways it has. I mean, I think this idea of continuously wanting to celebrate the resilience of whole entire communities means that in some ways, I mean, I don't know if I would use the word weaponized, but it's this, it's this idea of trying to take the fire out of something, you know, that we're going to celebrate you for the strength that you have, which is great. It's, it's like what Dr. Phil was saying about the strength approach. It's great. It's lovely, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, we can't just keep, we can't just keep celebrating whole communities for, for getting through something. It's just, it's that, I mean, I guess that's your sense of fairness. That's just not fair. That's not a just that doesn't make sense. So we want to celebrate uh, this idea of community. Um, and I don't, I, so I don't know the, the, the question, the answer to that question about, are we weaponizing it? I, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's as um, a strong as a weapon, you know, to, to say it like that, but it's definitely something that that's trying to take the fire, I think out of, or the, the burn out of the, the injustice. So it's also the exit strategy, right, for redistribution, because if someone is resilient, you don't need to give them anything. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an escape valve. It's an escape valve, community. Jeff. That's what it is. You're sure. right. <laughs> that we should be redistributing power and opportunity and, and, and all of these things that we yeah, need. Listen to Jeff's uh, so, uh, the, the example she, he gave, you know, it, it rings to me as resilience in the sense that it's not, it's not a state of being. It's I was doing something and some, somehow I was pulled up and, and I yeah. moved up or somebody did something. What I see in what I call the gospel of resilience is that it has become a state of being. It's not we celebrate Benita's resilience and then what can we do from now on? Where is it going? You know, it's not a one term thing, but what we now want is for that to stay. Oh, she's resilient, or this community is resilient. And that that's the end of the matter. Resilience should not be a state of being. It should yeah. be something that happened. And then where do we go? Because what he does that he keeps basically cleaning up the fact that <clears throat> people need support systems, that the support systems that are not in place to fight the systemic barriers. As, and, and as we keep moving into resilience, we keep losing sight of the systemic barriers that people face. That's really what concerns me. So every time I add the word resilience, I always add the word capacity to move on, ability to amplify whatever I have. It's the thing about, you know, you're just resilient. You have the capacity to survive. And I, I have a, I'm also a little bit concerned about the word survive uh, yeah. because many of us, you know, a lot of people from the, in the margins are already survivors. So in my village, people will say that we don't boast with suffering. You're supposed to suffer to get at something, not to continue to suffer for the rest of your life. But that is where those who live at the margins, that's where they are left to just keep going on. I really appreciate your point about it not being a consistent state. I mean, think of the, the energy that goes into to that effort, right? And and working towards something should yield something. That's sort of what I'm hearing from you. I appreciate that, yeah. Someone else wrote in and asked, um, so not to focus on, on words per se, but Lauren asks, resilience as a word can polarize instead of unify. 
because not everyone feels resilient. So Lauren asks, is there another way that we can talk about these things that may not lead to some people feeling ashamed of their inability to uh, achieve what they need or, or, or have access to what they need or want? I kind of like something that is action related uh, because that's what society, that's what we need now. Um, I, I don't, I like the celebration and all of that, but I am looking mm -hmm. at the ways that we can reach out and begin to uplift individuals and communities. Um, I don't think it matters to me much what it is called as opposed to what it yields. So mm -hmm. I think it's the yield that is more important to me. I don't think there is one word to go around because we are a very diversified uh, group. Uh, Canada is a multicultural society. And even if, if you remove the rest of us and just leave the indigenous people on their lands, they are a diversified group too. So, and I don't think they can all come together and call it something. For me, I, I want to focus on the yield. That's that's awesome. That's an awesome reminder. And I, I think, I think the, the, the danger is the patronizing aspect of it, you know, when it becomes a little bit like patronizing, like, oh, you're so resilient. <laughs> you know, it's this idea of like tapping people on the shoulders and you, you did so great. And here's a medal. Here's an award. And, you know, tell us about your trauma. And, you know, but but then it's like the, it's like it's like as you're saying, um, Philomena, it's like, what's the yield? So then what's the result? What happens? So even if we're honoring you in a patronizing way for your resilience, what's the next step? What's going to happen after that? Justin, do you have any thoughts to add to this part of the conversation? Um, I mean, there's always so much to add. Uh, but uh, no, it's just, it's been really great just uh, having all these uh, different points of views and uh, really great questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's to me, it's 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 very complex when you are still surviving, when you are being resilient. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to identify what that is. And for me, within this household uh, where we are, it's I'm the one that sees that this is a problem or this is bizarre that this is how you live or how you need to survive you know and the resilience in that when it's it's completely normalized because that's just the way things are right so i also kind of feel like an outsider when i'm when i'm here um because again bringing in that privilege um i know what it's like to have a long shower or not worry about can is my water safe to drink, you know, wherever I live, you know, I live many places in, in Canada. Um, so yeah, so that's um, a part of that. And one of the things I couldn't quite comprehend after the fact uh, is bringing one of uh, the these old stories of uh, Holy Bear Woman, who was a survivor of, uh, of a massacre who was Blackfoot uh, just on the, on the US side. Um, but we didn't have borders like that. We had cultural borders. Um, someone was saying, uh, you know, if you left all the indigenous people, we would be diverse as well. Um, because we are, we don't speak the same languages. The linguistics are somewhat the same. Uh, the sign language is somewhat the same. Um, but, you know, we didn't have those borders. Uh, sorry, went off the topic. Um, but yeah, talking about Holy Bear Woman and bringing the story that took about eight years uh, to bring back to the people either to remind or to teach this a lot of the new generations who this woman was and the large bloodline that we come from from this one individual of like over 300 people who were massacred was a child um, but even that of having to raise uh, with artistic funds and pools uh, and donations of almost half a million dollars in eight years where that money could have been put, that half a million dollars could have, you know, someone, we, I could have dug a well for my parents' place. You know, we could have fed so many different people. Uh, we I could have used that 
but it took you know that much financial effort of half a million dollars to bring to life <laughs> back mm. to a place that is still so struggling financially of basic needs right so it's it's always bizarre and I'm always challenged with that um, and mm -hmm. so it's really great to hear all these other perspectives yeah I mean this has been such a rich conversation and there's so much more that we could say unfortunately our time is wrapping up so I just want to thank you and I hope that we can continue this conversation offline and on on in any format that works you know on social media or just keep in touch. So I want to thank our speakers so much. Jeff, Vinita, Philomena, Justin, thank you so much. And thanks to the Walrus for organizing this conversation. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to you, Jen. Thank you so much, Amy. I'd also like to thank our speakers and everyone who joined us for this important conversation. Vinita Srivastava, Justin Many Fingers, Philomena Okeke Hizurka, and Jeff Adams. Uh, and again, Amy, you are an excellent moderator. It's great to be working with you again. Also, shout out to everyone in chat. We really appreciated your questions and comments throughout the evening. If you enjoyed this event, we have more coming up on Tuesday, June 8th. We are partnering with Facebook Canada to present the Walrus Talks at Home, the future of speech online. Check in with us at thewalrus.ca slash events. That's where you'll find our event schedule. You can register for events. We also post videos from all of our events. So that's where you'll see videos from tonight as well. You can go into our archives. Also, keep an eye on your email inbox. You're going to receive an email from us. And the best way to stay in touch and to never miss an event like this one is to opt in and sign up for our events newsletter. At The Walrus, we believe that trustworthy journalism is really an essential service. And with your support, we can continue to provide fact-checked, long-form journalism that Canadians can count on. So if you enjoyed this free event tonight, please consider making a donation at thewalrus.ca. Just click on donate. All gifts of $20 or more receive a charitable tax receipt. Thank you again to Naki Osute and everyone at TD Bank Group for making this conversation possible, but as well our long-standing partnership together. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, Shaw, and our newest annual sponsor, Facebook Canada. Community is so important in these COVID times, and you are all part of the walrus. Thanks again so much for joining us. Have a great evening, everyone.